Hey y'all, welcome back to the next episode in our Bully Range A50. And here's going to be the proof in the pudding. What have we accomplished by re rewiring this front end and doing these voltage modifications to this amplifier? So the signal we're going to be putting in, which the signal would be like the music, another way of thinking about it, but we use a, I'm using a TEMA signal generator with a one kilohertz sine wave that we're putting in. If you look here, we're on one volt per division. So we've got one, two, three volts peak to peak, which when you calculate it up, comes out to just a breath over one volt RMS, which is what CD players put out, modern CD players. It's what DAX put out between one and two volts RMS. Most phono stages put out one volt RMS. So this is a pretty normal strength signal that we would see out of modern sources. So we've got it hooked up to our Tektronix 2235 analog scope. And we've got it driving into an 8 ohm load off the 8 ohm taps of the transformer. And this first pull we're going to do is on the cast code rewired side of the amplifier. So as we turn our volume up, we're just starting to see clipping right there. So if we get just shy of clipping, and we're on 5 volts peak to peak, so we've got 5, 10, 15, 20 volts peak to peak out now, which is just over 6 watts of clean power with no clipping. And if I remember right, the original layout, the way it came out of the box, was just a little over 3 watts. So we've almost doubled the real power output of the amplifier with these modifications. So, big win there. The other thing to note here, and let me turn it back up, and we're going to put these on top of each other and then try to adjust the volume. You can see it's almost an identical sine wave coming out of the amp is what's going in. Again, that's what you that's what you want to see in an amplifier. So, super happy with how this turned out. But the next thing to see is what does the unmodified channel look like? And this is We've done no modifications to the front end. This is still the direct coupled 6SN7 pair with simply the voltage turned up both on the B plus going to the 300 Bs, but we've turned up the voltage on the plates of the driver tubes or at least the voltage feeding the plate resistors going to the driver tubes by about 80 volts. So let's take a pull on this and see what this looks like. Okay, going to hit the invert button because with it being a three-stage And right about there is where it stops clipping. Probably get a little more out before. Not quite. Right about there. And we're getting 5, 10, 15, about 18 volts peak to peak, which would be about 5.8 watts, something like that, which is another big increase from what we saw with the original amp. So the lesson here is that 
just cranking up the B plus gave us a lot of more drive out of the stock front end. But here's where the, the difference, one of the differences is the sine waves aren't the same. Even at, you know, pretty reduced power level from, you know, wide open, you can see these don't, these don't sit on top of each other like they do with the cast code. This top part's rounded off. So I'm expecting to see a lot more distortion out of this direct coupled setup than we are out of the cast code. So the next test that we're going to do while we're on the analog side is we're going to look at the voltage swing at the grid of the 300B tube. And we do this by turning the, if you look at the probe, it's got a little switch here where you can switch it to 10x multiplier on the probe. And this is going to be on the cast code. So, leaving this on 5 volts for, per division, if you look over here, it shows on the 10x probe, it's 50 volts, which obviously 5 times 10 is 50. So, we're going to see 50 volts per division. Now, understand this is on the other side of the coupling capacitor, so we, we're not dealing with DC at this point. This is just the AC voltage swing that is on the grid of the output tube. And again, we have the uh, 50 volts per division because we're on the 10x multiplier on the probe. And we can see it's just starting to clip down here, right there. If we move that up, we got 50, 100, almost 150, about 145 volts peak to peak of swing into the grid of the output tube, which is really good drive for a 300B. That's They want to see, you know, somewhere around 150, 160, ideally. And so we're really close, close to the swing that we want to see there. The other thing to note is, look how similar these two patterns are. I mean, there's a, there's a little more peak-to-peak, -peak, you know, on this, uh, on the input. You can't get them to line up perfectly, but the shape is identical, which is what you want to see. So that's, we're getting very nice, clean signal, 145 volts peak-to-peak -peak into the grid of the output tube, and this is from the cast code side. So we're going to do the same test over here on the, the grid of the direct coupled side. Hit our invert button. And it starts clipping about right there. And Are hard clipping about right there and so we're getting 50 100 150 we're getting about five volts more peak to peak out of the direct coupled pair of triodes but look at this look at the shape of these two curves they're not even similar see how this one's all squished up on the bottom and how this, this one appears all spread apart compared to the, this is the input signal. And look how distorted the output of this driver stage is going into the grid of the 300B. That is not what we want to see. So while we have been able to really get the voltage swing up on this direct coupled pair by cranking up the voltage, what we've ended up with is a very distorted signal driving the output tube. Now, for some reason, the outputs don't show this heavy distortion like we're seeing on the grid of the 
output tube out of this driver stage, but that right there is showing me that the CAS code just hands down wins this competition between these two channels. And there's no way that this distorted ass signal going into the output tube is going to sound better than what we're seeing on the CAS code tube. So the next thing we want to do is hook this thing up to the Analog Discovery 2 with the Audio Analyzer Suite and make some pulls on it and see what we get with THD versus distortion, frequency response, and all you know the other tests that that setup can give us. So let me hook the amp up to that stuff. Okay. So we have the amp hooked up now to the Analog Discovery 2, and we've let it warm up for about 10 minutes. To clarify, this is running the PS vein tubes that the amp comes with, but it's running the 5A or 4 rectifier, which we're using to get the B plus up, and then it's also running a pair of new old stock Sylvania tall bottle tubes, which are some pretty low distortion tubes just to take the driver tube distortion out of the equation here. So the first pull is going to be on the unmodified direct coupled 6S and 7 pair of triodes with the voltage jacked up where we saw that we were getting almost 20 volts peak to peak on the sine wave out on the analog scope but let's see how it does versus distortion especially when we saw how much distortion there was on the grid of the 300b tube when we were checking the grid analog scope pattern so here comes this pull it's starting out over a half a percent distortion even at very low volume levels we just went past one percent and there's where it starts just climbing out of the roof so if we're talking about it ten percent distortion it's putting out eight and a half watts but nobody's going to listen to it at ten percent distortion think 3% it's probably about as high as you want to listen to a tube amp even if the distortion is pleasant sounding you don't want it coloring the sound so much that you can't enjoy the original music so at higher volume levels I think you could probably tolerate around 3% so that's kind of what we're going to look at and at 3% distortion it's making four and a half watts. When we come down here to where it crosses one percent, it's making 1.1 watts. So even though we were seeing a lot of voltage swing on the analog scope at the 8 ohm outputs, there's a lot of distortion going along with it. So now we're going to switch to the Cascode side and see what kind of readings we get out of it. And we're already looking way better. It's actually going underneath the signal, which is a really good sign. And it doesn't really turn up here till the very top end. So again, at, at 8.5 watts where the other driver was at 10%, we're at 7.8. But the important thing is, is at 3%, we're putting out almost 7 watts. So we're putting out over 2 watts more power at the same distortion level with the CAS code front end. And then let's see down here when we cross the 1%. We're putting out 3.2 watts at 1% distortion. 
which is three times the power that we were getting out of the direct coupled pair at 1% distortion. So, in my opinion, this is already a win for the CAS code. The next pull we want to make is as far as frequency response. And the first pull we're going to do is on the direct coupled pair as the amp was originally wired with the voltage cranked up. Okay, here's the pull we just made on this. And as you can see over here, this is at uh, 20 hertz. We're down that much. This is at 28 hertz. There's 40 hertz. And it doesn't really start flatlining on the bottom end till, I mean, almost 100 hertz before there's no roll off. I mean, this area in here isn't bad, but you're probably going to hear this down here. Now, again, it's rolling off past 10K. And if you're really concerned about having something that has a lot of brightness from like 10 to 20K, we would need to do some more tuning on this amp, or I'm not even sure that this amp would be the one to use. We might have to change transformers. I don't even know if that would bring it around. I'm not worried about it. My own personal hearing is actually dead past 10K, so I really don't give a damn what happens after 10K for my listening. And there's not a lot of music going on up there anyway. So... The fact that it rolls off at 10K isn't what concerns me. It's the roll off on the bottom end that's more concerning to me because you will hear and feel that loss on the bass. Which is, again, I've heard people complain about this amp doesn't have a lot of bass or that the bass sounds really weak. And that's what I'm seeing in this frequency roll off. So let's, let's see what happens here when we do a pull on the CAS code. Huge difference. We're not seeing any roll off even down at 10 hertz. At 20 hertz, it's putting out the same decibel levels as it is at 1K, as it is at 8K. I mean, that's like a dead flat frequency response curve. Now, one thing that we might consider doing is lowering this coupling capacitor to try to get this bottom end to roll off some. And the amplifier might actually sound better with a 22 0.22 UF cap instead of a 0.33. So that's something that I may look at tuning on. But right now, another huge win for the CAS code for bass reproduction. And I can tell you this is going to be audibly better on the bottom end than that other wired front end is going to be. So the last test we want to do is the... THD versus frequency. So let's switch over to that. And first we're going to make a pull on the as wired direct coupled pair of triodes. Okay, here's the completed pull and you can see that the THD is, this is at 3 watts that it's well over 1% through the whole frequency range, but it is pretty flat, which is a sign that these trans output transformers are actually fairly decent. I mean, I'm impressed. The other thing that I want to point out, because some people talk about, oh, my, you know, my pull is THD plus noise and THD. This amp doesn't have a lot of noise. I mean, it changes maybe a, a part of a percent 
going from THD to TH, no, THD plus noise. So there's not a ton of there's not a ton of noise in this amplifier. So let's switch to the other channel and see what we get out of the cascode pair at the same three watts of output. Okay, this pull definitely looks different. We're seeing about the same distortion levels at the very low end, but it slowly ramps down to 1%. But this distortion down on the below 100 hertz, the way it slowly ramps up, I'm not sure if that's because the coupling cap is too large or whether it's just this has low enough distortion where we're actually seeing it in the output transformer. I think I am going to try a 0.22 UF coupling capacitor and maybe give us a little roll off on the bottom end on the frequency response curve, which I think really would help this amp. Obviously, with the other channel, it was suffering from low frequency roll off and reducing the cap would just probably make it worse. I do want to go ahead and drop a 0.22 UF coupling cap into the cast coded side and see what that gets us. Okay, so we soldered in a 0.22 UF coupling cap in and let's see what that does to our frequency response curve. And we're seeing a slight bit of roll off down here below 20 hertz. Still not what I would consider really rolling off. But I'd like to listen to the amp before I start lowering that coupling capacitor anymore. Because one of the things that we're really trying to fix on this amp is the bass response. And I don't want to do anything that's going to limit the bass that the amp can put out. So I'm going to stop right here. Clearly dropping the coupling cap didn't hurt the bass response and so I think I'm going to run with this. Plus I would have to order some smaller coupling caps and I got a couple of 0.22 UF Mundorf caps that I'm not using right now. So let's drop those in and go from there. Well guys, I think that wraps up this three-part series on the Bowie Range A50 advanced modifications. And while again, these weren't really simple, we did end up rewiring the whole front end, which luckily it was point to point, so it was actually doable. But I think it's something simple enough that most people can do once they get some soldering skills under their belt. So. Don't be afraid of this. It was a huge win. We doubled the power that this amplifier makes. And we got the distortion numbers way down from what we started from. This amp actually now puts out very close to the 7.6 watts that it's advertised at. It's right at 7 watts at 3% distortion. And you saw all the other numbers. It really looks great. The other thing that I learned from this was don't just look at the analog scope output at the speaker jacks. That doesn't tell the whole story. Look at the waveform at the grid of the output tube. Because as we saw, the cast code version didn't show any distortion on the grid where the direct coupled one did, when we ran it on the Analog Discovery 2, we saw the same distortion problem. And so if you don't have the Analog Discovery 2 or the Audio Analyzer Suite or some other something similar to that, and all you have is like an analog scope or even a digital scope, make sure you check the sine wave at the grid of the output tube. And make sure you do it on the side where the coupling cap is so you're not getting into the high voltage DC. And it's safe to put your probe there. And 
check it what kind of voltage swing and what the scope pattern looks like there because that tells the story. So from here I'm going to wire up the other channel. Uh, I may do a quick little video on some tricks I'm going to do to the heater wiring on the 6S and 7 to hopefully reduce some of the hum that this amp has. It's not a lot, but it's always better to try to reduce it if we can. I'm going to put some grid stopper resistors on the 300B tubes. And then the final mods on this amp is going to be doing a little bit of cleanup on some of the wiring that I'm not really crazy about. And we're also going to address the cathode resistors being on the underside of that circuit board. I know those cathode resistors get hot. The ones on my other 300B, they get really toasty. And so we don't want to have those things with all that heat rising up and baking those printed circuit boards. You know that they're never going to be available for purchase or replacement parts. So while the amp may run good for a few years, five years from now, those resistors are going to cook that circuit board and you're going to have a problem. So I'm going to show you how I'm going to make some heat sinks to mount those remotely behind that circuit board and where the heat sinks will then transfer the heat up to the top plate and you won't have to worry about it cooking that circuit board. So once I get this thing wired up on both channels, when I take it up to do my listening sessions, obviously report back on how the whole amp sounds compared to my DIY 300B amp and hopefully be wrapping this thing up in less than a week. So hope you're enjoying this series. I know I've enjoyed doing it. If you like the channel, please subscribe, like the video, and we'll see you back here soon for more 300B fun. Have a nice day.